Aggie. And here now, since we've started with Geoffrey Chaucer, the father of English literature and English poetry, this is an important text in terms of uh, studying literature, in terms of appearing for competitive exams, especially the UGC net exam, and also for looking back into the history of English literature and poetry. Now, when we talk about Chaucer, the most important text that comes to mind is the Canterbury Tales. And here we are chiefly concerned with the prologue to the Canterbury Tales. Now, we see that Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is not only his masterpiece among his own works, but uh, these tales are also the high point of all English medieval literature. Although the work has come to us in a fragmented form, yet the scheme was to embrace a collection of stories which was actually to be told by that group of pilgrims who were planning to journey from London to Canterbury and then be back again. So in that group of pilgrims, each of the 30 people would be telling a tale and it would uh, some total up to 120 tales. But instead of those 120 tales, in the Canterbury Tales, we just have 21 complete tales and three unfinished stories. So here when we talk about the book Canterbury Tales, the prologue forms an important and inseparable part of this book. Now why is prologue important? Is for several reasons. Prologue actually gives us the picture of that period of England of which we do not have much literature by our side. And in all English literature, there is no such picture of a whole society of England as is shown in the prologue. And Chaucer contrived the whole of England in some 30 characters and 860 lines. So, we notice that Chaucer's sense of actuality is mingled with a sense of hierarchy and he presents the characters in a kind of a jumbled way also, um, neglecting the ranks also, but then he also covers all the ranks and trades and profession as much as possible. So from the point of view of a historian and also from the point of view of a student of literature, studying his prologue in the form of poetry becomes important. So this text, the prologue starts with the lines, when April comes with his sweet fragrant showers, which pierce the dry ground of March and bathe every root of every plant and sweet liquid, then people desire to go on pilgrimages. Now here is when we come to know, now this is an important famous opening to the Canterbury Tales because here the narrator who is Chaucer himself is uh, actually planning a scheme of this journey which is a pilgrimage and they are planning at a particular location which is the Tabard Inn in Southwark in London where this company of 29 people arrive in that particular inn and they prepare to go for a pilgrimage to Canterbury. So they talk to each other, they discuss the whole program, and he, Chaucer, himself agrees to join them on the pilgrimage, and then that scheme of storytelling is made. But here in prologue, we see that the Chaucer, I'm sorry, not the Chaucer, Chaucer describes all the characters which belong to that society of England about which we get a very very clear picture in this prologue. So we will have a look at the list of these characters uh, which take the whole of the place of the prologue and which give us a proper picture and which also make us realize how meticulously Chaucer has worked on the characterization of these people and that is why this text is also called, this book is also called the Portrait Gallery. Now the first character which takes its place in the book is the knight and the knight is actually described as a worthy man of high status. Why? Because he holds a senior position in the hierarchy of the court of the king. He has fought several times in crusades in numerous countries. He has been honoured for his worthiness and his curtsy. He is very well-mannered, courteous. Everywhere where he went, Chaucer tells us that he had a 
sovereign price price means he had an outstanding reputation or he had a price on his head for the fightings he had done now this knight is dressed up in a fustian tunic made of coarse cloth which is actually stained by the rust from his coat of chain mail now this is a very brief description of the knight which is the first character introduced in the prologue we may go into the details of these characters because we also find the description of their dresses their shoes their weapons the tools they are carrying and even their horses they all have horses with them because that was the only mode of transport at that time so briefly we are looking into the characters and the next character is the knight's son he has his son along with him and that son is the squire now the squire is a young bachelor a lover a passionate lover just 20 years old and he has a kind of an effeminate figure slender his clothes are beautifully embroidered with flowers red and white and he is constantly singing or even playing the flute he can dance very well he's a nice artist and uh, he is one pilgrim who also has literary ambitions he could make songs he could write songs he could even he's creative and literary so he is the knight's son then of course yes they also have with them a servant who is the yeoman now this yeoman is actually assisting the squire and the knight and he's clad in a coat and hood of green he is excellent at caring for his arrows and travels armed with a huge amount of weaponry like arrows arm guard sword buckler dagger which is as sharp as a spear and he is wearing an image of saint christopher on his breast now this was the highest ranking pilgrim which he chaucer starts with the knight and then his son and then their assistant now he proceeds next to the clergy the people who are associated with the church and beginning with this lady the prioress whose name is madam aglantine she is one character who can beautifully sweetly sing religious services she speaks fluent french she has excellent table manners she is charitable she is piteous and she is an ironical character in a way that chaucer describes her that she is so piteous she is so soft hearted that she could even weep if she saw a mouse caught in a trap She also has two small dogs with her whom she would feed very well. She wears a brooch with the inscription Amor vincit omnia which means love conquers all. Now this prioress again brings with her an assistant a secretary a chaplain who is the second nun. Now the next character in series is the monk Now this monk is an extremely fine and handsome man who loves to hunt. On the contrary we find that monks are actually associated with monasteries and they are religious people associated with the clergy. But here we have an ironical description of how a monk should be and how this monk is. So he follows modern customs rather than the old traditions of religion. so he is no bookish monk he doesn't believe in those bookish ideologies and philosophies he is no bookish monk who studies in a cloister but he is a man who actually keeps with him greyhounds the hunting dogs to hunt the hare so he is a kind of a monk who is modern very very contrasting to the traditional monks that we would imagine he is well fed Uh, he's fat well fed which shows his physique shows that he's overeating his eyes are bright gleaming like a furnace in his head now then we have a friar who follows him this friar is also kind of carefree wanton and merry and he is a limiter by trade by profession he is a limiter now limiter means that he this friar is licensed he has the power to beg in certain specific districts of that area 
Now he is extremely beloved of the landowners of that area and also the worthy women of that town because his jobs are that he hears the confessions he gives absolutions confessions means people come to the church and confess their sins their crimes their guilts and he gives them kind of uh, plans to absolve themselves to it is like price chit karna so he gives them those tips he gives them those absolution tips and he's an excellent beggar he is able to earn himself a farthing wherever he goes farthing means the currency of that time his name is hubbard now in the next series in the next group of people that chosa talks about we have a merchant in the first place now this merchant is actually uh peculiar because of his forked beard his beard is in the shape of a fork his motley multicolored clothes and he sat high upon his horse he gives his opinion very seriously does an excellent business as a merchant as a trader and has never been in any debt so he has earned a lot of money but the narrator chosser ominously remarks i note now men him call that i do not know how men call him or think of him so no big opinions about this merchant then this clerk follows the merchant now this clerk is a student of actually oxford university and he is a very serious and a studious kind of a character he would rather have 20 books by aristotle than having rich clothes or musical instruments or things of luxury and therefore we find him dressed in a threadbare short coat he has little gold little money and he tends to spend a lot on books and learning takes huge care huge uh, gives huge time to studies and he never speaks a word more than what is needed which is very short precise full of sentence means full of meaningfulness so chaucer holds high opinion good opinions about this clerk who is a student of oxford then we have the man of law now the man of law of course from the word itself we understand that he is a lawyer he is a judge here he is also called the sergeant of law now he is a judicious and intelligent a clever and a dignified man because his words are wise he is a judge in the court of assizes by letter of appointment from the king and because of this high standing high status he receives many grants he can draw upon a legal document and no one can find a flaw in his legal writings uh, but despite all the riches he has got lots of money and social worth this sergeant rides only in a homely multicolored coat now there is a franklin which who travels with this man of law he has a beard as white as a daisy and of a sanguine humor dominated by his blood this franklin is a big eater he is very fond of eating fond of eating rich food he loves a piece of bread dipped in wine and is described as epicurus's son now epicurus's son we can imagine epicurus means eat drink be be merry this is the purpose of life So this Franklin also lives for culinary delight. He is very fond of eating and culinary delicacies. His house is always full of meat pie, fish, and meat things, meat products, so that anybody could come and enjoy in his house. And he changes his dishes. He changes his drinks and his meats according to the foods of the season. Then we have a group of skilled workers. like a haberdasher a carpenter a weaver a dyer and a tapestry tapicer means a weaver of tapestries now these are all dressed up in the in a similar kind of a dress and they did not tell a tale or a story so these the, these are a group of people who were together then we have a cook who has come with them to boil the chicken and uh, he accompanies these people for the services then we have a shipman shipman from dartmouth is next tanned brown from the hot summer sun riding upon a cot 
cart horse and wearing a gown of coarse woolen cloth which reaches up to his knees. Now this shipman as from the name from the title we can infer is basically concerned with the ship and his, uh, his trade services in the sea. He has seen many storms in the sea, he knows his trade very well and he knows the locations of all the harbours from Gotland to Cape Finistry means the whole area and his ship is called the Modelin. Now he owns this ship and he is quite an adept sailor of the ship who is actually an active uh, shipman for the trading purposes. Then we have a doctor of medicine. Now he is an important character because in those days in 14th century England we had these doctors and these kind of traits in these people. Now this particular doctor is dressed up in red and blue and uh, he's matchless. He is an expert in speaking about medicine and surgery. He knows the cause of every illness. He knows how to cure them. He is a perfect practitioner. And he has apothecaries, means chemists who are ready to send him all kinds of drugs and mixtures and medicines. He is well read in the medical books from the Greeks. And, but he is not, uh, he is not religious. He hasn't studied the Bible. Now here we have a very, very important, in fact, the most important character of the prologue, which is the wife of Bath. Now this is a lady who is somewhat deaf. She cannot completely hear and she is so adept, she is so perfect at making cloth that she beats and surpasses all the cloth weavers and cloth makers of the area around her. She is a very fashionable lady. She wears handkerchiefs, linen kerchiefs to cover her head which are actually heavy. They must have weighed 10 pounds also. She had had five husbands through the church door. She has been to Jerusalem, Rome, on pilgrimages. She is gap toothed. Her teeth have gap in between them. And she knew the whole kind of dance as far as love is concerned. So she doesn't carry a very good reputation but she is a smart character. She is an important character of the prologue. Then we have the parson whom Chaucer actually praises. A parson is a good religious man who although is poor in goods but is rich in holy thought and work. He is learned. He preaches Christ's gospel. He is devoted to his parishioners, means the people living in his parish. He travels across his parish to visit the people on his feet, carrying a stick in his hand. He is a noble example to the people around him because he acts what he preaches. And the narrator even says that there is no better priest to be found anywhere like this parson. Then we have this parson's brother, the plowman who is actually a hard-working man, he lives in peace, he is a farmer, he rides a mare and wears a loose garment called the tabard. Then we have a miller. Now this miller is actually, he is a, he's a big man, he has big muscles and he has been winning prizes in wrestling matches. He could lift hard and heavy things, he has black a wide nose carries a sword in a buckler and has a great mouth which has been compared to a furnace. He is good at stealing corn and taking payment for it three times. Then we have this business agent called the Mansiple. He is actually a purchaser of religious provisions and he is a financial operator also. He, although he is a common man, but he can run rings around even a heap of learned men, means he could deceive, he could cheat anybody. Then we have this person called the Reeve. Now this Reeve is a slender, slim, lean, long-legged man and he knows exactly how much grain he has in his granary. He is the granary keeper. And uh, there is no farmer, herdsman or servant about whom this reef does not know something secret. 
So as a result, people are afraid of him because he knows the secret of most of the people. Then we have Summoner. This Summoner has a skin disease across his black brows and his beard and he is extremely lecherous or deceitful. And the narrator says there is no ointment or cure which can help him remove his pimples and he loves drinking wine which is as red as blood means red as blood and eating leeks, onions and garlics. Then we have another character travelling with the summoner who is the noble pardoner who is his friend and his companion. This pardoner has a thin boyish voice which is specific and peculiar in his case. Uh, and then... In the last place, we have the host, who is Harry Bally, the host, the last member of the company, who is a large man with bright large eyes and extremely fair. This host welcomes everyone to his inn, which is the Tabard Inn, and announces the pilgrimage to Canterbury and decides that on the way there shall be storytelling and everybody listens to him, consents to his plan. And the next morning when they are about to move, this host awakes everyone up and assists them in leaving. So we see that this general prologue was written uh, probably early in the composition of the book The Canterbury Tales and offers an interesting comparison to, to the, portrayal of the, uh, the portrayal of the individual characters of that age. But these characters are also types. For, for example, we have the type of merchant, we have the type of fisherman, we have the type of doctor, but we also have the individual traits with these characters. So this was a brief analysis about the characters of the general prologue, uh, which is in the beginning of the book, The Canterbury Tales. We will look into how these characters are portrayed with different streaks and features of characterization in the coming video. Stay tuned. Thank you for now.